we've titled the, the session today, um, Smart Alone, Brilliant Together, um, which is one of our truths at Crossref, and we'll come to those later. Um, I also wanted to explain the, the rationale behind the, um, the meeting today. Initially, this was going to be an in-person meeting in, um, in Washington, DC. That isn't possible at the moment, but certainly we look forward to it being so in future. Um, we've got a lot of members and other key organizations, old and new in this time zone. And we're conscious that we want to keep you in the loop in terms of what we're working on and how this, how that might fit with your goals. So let's start first of all with, um, with hellos. Um, my name is Rachel Lamy and I'm head of, um, I'm head of special programs at Crossref. And you're probably all quite familiar with Zoom by now, but it would be nice to, um, to kind of get a, a picture of, of what's in the, who's in the room today for everyone. So if you'd like to introduce yourself using the chat function in Zoom, um, then please just take a few moments to, to do that. So while you're doing that, I wanted to take you through the, um, just take you through the agenda for, for today. Um, I've already got the welcome underway. Um, so by way of a bit of, a, of an overview, um, I'm joined by some of my colleagues who will speak throughout, um, throughout the course of these, these sessions. And obviously they can introduce themselves in the chat as well. Um, but I'll also let them introduce themselves at the, at the start of each, of each of their sessions. Um, but you can see we've got a nice cross section um, of speakers from various groups within and across our organization. Um, from the, the product side, outreach from, um, from Ed as executive director and from Patricia as, as head of metadata. So we're gonna cover quite a broad, um, quite, you know, sort of quite a, quite a full program of things today in terms of, of what we're working on and what's coming next. Um, I think as well, it's really important to note that we're gonna take a break between sort of 10, 15 and, um, and 10, 30, so that you can, you can stretch your legs and, and, and have a bit of a break from, from Zoom. So thank you very much for introducing yourselves. Um, I said, we've got a nice range from publishers, societies, funders, service providers, submission systems and, and more, which is, which is great. Um, and I've already touched on the goals today. Yes, to provide updates on what we're working on. And we'd also like to, we'd also like to hear from you as well. Um, as with a lot of these things, I'm gonna keep attendees muted during the call just to avoid background noise. But we will have time for questions at the end of each presentation, um, which, which will moderate and also kind of a longer Q&A section towards the end of the day. If you do have any um, if you do have questions at any time, um, you can ask those using the, the Q and A functionality in, in Zoom. Um, from our perspective, um, and sort of my team have been running quite a few webinars recently. It means that you can see questions. You should be able to upvote questions if someone's asked something that you're interested in, and respond to questions there as well. It does mean that it's a bit easier as well from our side to get kind of a transcript afterwards in case we miss any and then we can pick them up from that channel. And we're also happy to, um, to share slides afterwards. Um, that's some of the, um, that's kind of the initial, um, the initial things covered. Um, but what I'm gonna do is um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna let Ed start things off um, to talk about what's been happening at Crossref over the course of what feels like a very busy few years. So Ed, can I pass over to you? Yes, thank you. Hi, uh, thank you, Rachel. I'm Ed Pence, I'm Executive Director of Crossref and uh, great to have you all here today uh, for this, uh, for this uh, vir virtual get together. Uh, and I'm gonna do um, sort of a introduction and, 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 and scene setting, uh, talking a little bit about uh, 
uh, the, the, the big picture. So let me just uh, get my screen sharing here. Great. Yep, that's great. Okay, thank you. Excellent. So yes, uh, I'm joining you from um, uh, from from Oxford, from from the attic room in my house in o Oxford, England, and um, uh, I'm very happy uh, to be uh, speaking uh, to you today uh, as the, the the new executive director of uh, of Crossref. Uh, some of you may have heard earlier this year. Uh, that I had decided to, uh, to to leave Crossref. That was back in back in February, uh, but then in July, uh, I was very happy to announce that I had uh, uh, decided to uh, to stay, uh, and and that uh, the board had accepted the rescinding of my uh, uh, resignation. So so uh, between February and July, uh, what what happened? Well, uh, I think one of the big things that happened was the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. Uh, and um, uh, you know that prompted a lot of people to 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 think about things, to rethink things. It wasn't business as usual, uh, and that was uh, certainly the case uh, with with me. And um, I think part of it was not not traveling for a while. Uh, you know, I had time to think about things, and and really, I couldn't think of anything uh, better to do with my professional life than to, to uh, remain leading Crossref uh, because of, it has such an important, important mission. And uh, I was very impressed with the resilience of the, the Crossref team uh, and also the, the organization itself and, and, and our community. Uh, and, uh, and, and it's a great group of people. It's a great community. And uh, so I decided I wanted to, uh, to, to, to remain and, and, and continue to lead lead Crossref. And so uh, that's, uh, I haven't regretted it since July and uh, think things are moving ahead really, uh, really well on many fronts as we'll hear here today. Uh, and the other thing I'm gonna be talking about is that at its July board meeting, the, 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 the Crossref board passed uh, a number of key strategic uh, resolutions. So I'm gonna be talking about those, uh, talking about those in, in a few minutes. So just just touching on the Crossref staff, uh, you may not be able to to see this uh, very clearly, but this is the the, the current Crossref team. Uh, you can look on our our website uh, for uh, uh, if you want to look at more details. But uh, and we'll make we'll make these slides available uh, after uh, uh, after the uh, webinar today. Uh, but uh, uh, we've got a great team. Uh, so I just wanted to, to say. Uh, thanks to the team for their for their dedication uh, and hard work, and uh, we've had about eight new people in uh, over the last sort of year to eighteen months. We've had eight new people joining, either replacing people who who retired or or, or left, and uh, we'll be hearing about a couple of the new people a little bit later on 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 the product team. Um, but I just wanted to uh, hi highlight the the team that make makes everything that you're going to be hearing about today. Uh, possible and 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 makes it happen. So I wanted to uh, mention some highlights from from this year about what Crossref has been doing and uh, how we're doing ov overall. Uh, as many other organizations uh, have have done, um, we have been thinking about what we could do to help accelerate re research in the in the light of uh, the pandemic. Uh, and so earlier this year, uh, we made. Uh, a free public data file, free public data file, available with all Crossref's uh, uh, public public metadata. Uh, so not including closed or, or limited references. So while we have many, uh, uh, we have a number of different open APIs and search interfaces. This, this was the first time uh, we've made all the metadata available uh, in, in in this way, and uh, and there's been a lot of downloading and and, and use of that. Uh, data. Uh, in addition, we also highlighted a way that um, uh, publishers can highlight uh, content uh, that's available for text uh, text mining. So we have uh, a, a normal process for that happening, but then a lot of uh, organizations, a lot of publishers have stepped up and made uh, content available openly, uh, uh, maybe on a temporary basis, and uh, or, or there's obviously lots of OA content. Uh, and uh, we, we we provided information about how publishers can uh, make that 
uh, information available through the uh, through the Crossref uh, metadata, and and then there's been pretty good uh, uh, take up of that to to enable better text and text and data mining for that. Um, not related directly to the to the pandemic, uh, this year I think saw a really a really big change, uh, and that is we dropped the uh, cross mark fee. So this is all about uh, best practice and uh, improving metadata and reducing barriers to to to, to best to best practice. So Crossref Crossmark has been a service uh, that Crossref has had for many years, but there was an extra uh, a fee associated with that. So any any um, content that had the extra Crossmark uh, metadata uh, had had an extra fee associated with it. Uh, but uh, we've we the board uh, voted to uh, to remove this fee, uh, and so earlier this year we put out a call, and I'll do it again now uh, to really encourage everyone uh, to register metadata, particularly about uh, corrections and retractions. So uh, there are really two parts to Crossmark, and that is the uh, there's a Crossmark button uh, with a pop-up box that you put on uh, HTML pages or embed in PDFs, so that uh, so that when you click on the uh, uh, click on the button, uh, you can check the status of that content to see whether there have been any updates or changes, and some critical updates and changes that happened to scholarly content are uh, corrections and, 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 and retractions, and this is really critical information, and it, and it demonstrates how publishers uh, uh, maintain the scholarly record, uh, and so uh, we really want to make sure that there, there's more widespread use of this, uh, widespread use of this, uh, of this metadata. Uh, and uh, so um, uh, at the moment, there are about uh, just about 5,000 retractions reported uh, via the metadata and over 76,000 corrections, as, as, as well as some uh, uh, other updates. And again, that's all available through, through the REST API and uh, very, various, other, uh, various other interfaces. So I, so I think this was a, a very important change. And we'll be hearing from some of the other speakers about many of the other things that are uh, been going on uh, this year, but looking at this this issue then of uh, of, ha of how we're doing, uh, uh, grant identifiers are are rolling out and funders are joining joining Crossref. Uh, uh, membership is still growing. We've been keeping a close eye on it. Content is still growing. Both are up about uh, nine percent uh, compared with uh, uh, with last year. Um, of course, we've seen a, a lot of growth with. Uh, uh, with 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 preprints and other type, there's still a lot of lot of publishing uh, going on. Uh, we pivoted to virtual events, as you can see here, but we've had many different uh, uh, regional uh, webinars as well, and the, those have gone really well. And so we're engaging with as many or more people than we than we have in in the past. Um, the staff uh, has moved to 100 uh, percent. Uh, working from home, uh, and as part of that, we, we've always been distributed. We've always had people working from home, uh, but uh, we're now uh, having to rethink how we work, as everybody uh, is. And um, yeah, it's raise, raising some interesting issues because we're not just uh, working uh, from home; we're we're being uh, we're working from home during a pandemic. Uh, kids may be home. Uh, from from school, there may be other stresses uh, and uh, uh, family issues, and so so it's uh, can be difficult. But uh, but you know we're 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 getting through it, and um, uh, we're now thinking about how we how how we communicate. And actually, tomorrow we have a uh, a session with the Crossref staff where we're going to get together to to uh, uh, to meet virtually because we can't meet face to face to talk about some of these talk about some of these issues. Um, we're continuing to engage with members uh, and, the, and the community as much as we can. We recognize that there's a lot of disruption and they're going to be uh, there, there are potential financial problems. Uh, and so that all leads us to, uh, you know, we're, we're now starting to work on our budget for next year. There's a lot of uncertainty, but we're just trying to budget as conservatively um, as, as possible going uh, forward uh, into, the, uh, into the future. Earlier this year, it seems like a long time ago now, in January, January 19th uh, to be exact, uh, Crossref had uh, its, its 20th anniversary, the 20th anniversary of our, our incorporation uh, as, as an organization, uh, a not-for-profit organization. And um, uh, so that was really uh, a time 
to uh, looking forward but last year in 2019, looking forward to our anniversary, uh, uh, 20, 20th anniversary uh, prompted a, a period of, uh, of, of re uh, reflection really. And uh, Ginny and I uh, wrote a blog post uh, uh, try, trying to capture some of this, uh, think, thinking about who, who we are, uh, what we do, the value we provide, uh, and and so we saw that uh, coming coming up our 20th anniversary, it was a time for reflection, and we and we did that, uh, and uh, we we uh, did some value research, uh, uh, talked to a lot of our talked to a lot of our members, uh, and uh, and at our annual meeting in Amsterdam in November uh, 2019 at Live 19, uh, we got a lot of really good good uh, uh, feedback there about Crossref and uh, what what our priorities should be. And one of the interesting questions that came up uh, during that meeting uh, is, uh, was prompted by Todd Toller from, from Wiley. And he said, is Crossref a scholarly infrastructure provider or a publisher services organization? Uh, and um, I think this gets to uh, the heart of some of the issues that, that we've been discussing for a number of years uh, at, uh, at Crossref. Uh, and for, first of all, to say, that uh, these things aren't aren't mutually exclusive, right? We couldn't uh, we can uh, we we can do both, but I think what's become clear over the last year is that really uh, Crossref is uh, primarily a scholarly infrastructure provider, uh, and we provide services to our members, uh, many of whom are our publishers and organizations who, who who publish, and we do that to further our role, but all in the context of of uh, providing open uh, scholarly uh, scholarly infrastructure. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit, uh, and then just uh, take us up to the uh, July uh, board motions uh, that uh, kind of address this point about uh, about infrastructure. Crossref is sometimes referred to as a a, a, a trade association. So uh, we have a a, a number of uh, different statuses. So, so we're incorporated as a legal entity in New, as a New York state not-for-profit. We then uh, are set up through our bylaws as a, a membership association. So there's one member, one vote, and a membership is open to organizations who produce original scholarly material uh, and, and content. Uh, so, so that's defined fairly, fairly broadly. And there's, there's one member, one vote. Uh, and uh, we have tax exempt status with the US government as a 501c6 organization, which is typically a, tra a trade association. Uh, but the uh, tax exempt status and our uh, nonprofit status does provide an uh, obligation to provide benefit to the broader kind of non member community as we, as we, as we think about it, the, sc the scholarly community where, uh, where, where, where we operate. And um, so, Really, the the benefits to the members are in, incidental to the to the uh, broader industry and 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 community uh, benefit. Now we can look at it; it's not uh, mutually exclusive. But by providing services to our members and making things easy to do easier to do for our members is a way of serving that uh, serving that larger mission that that uh, that broader com community. And and that's the balance that we always have to. Uh, that's the balance that we have, always have to work out. But I, but I think it's important to go back to the uh, uh, our certificate of incorporation when we were first set up and what the goal of the organization was uh, set out to be at that point. And uh, it was to uh, promote the development and cooperative use of new and innovative technologies to speed and facilitate scientific and other scholarly research. So that is uh, quite, uh, quite broad, and um, yes, we've been uh, uh, trying to fulfill that mission and, and refine that mission, and that and that mission changes uh, over time, obviously. So uh, we started off effectively, really, to enable reference linking between publishers. They were signing bilateral reference uh, bilateral linking agreements with each other. And uh, that what that wasn't scalable, so so Crossref was originally set up to assign DOIs to solve that particular problem. Uh, but over the years, we've we've expanded the content types that we deal with. So we're we're a registry of all this 
uh, metadata about scholarly content. And you can see here that uh, there, uh, there are now uh, many of them. Uh, we're adding more all the time. Uh, the two most recent ones are uh, grants and uh, preprints. I think we're just over 500,000 preprints in the system. And uh, you'll be hearing about some of the uh, other, other content types that we're working on at the moment. Um, <clears throat> but just as importantly, we've uh, expanded the, the metadata uh, and the links and the relationships uh, that are uh, uh, captured in the, in the metadata. So I mentioned corrections and retractions, but licenses, uh, funding information, ORCID IDs, data site DOIs, uh, uh, preprint to version of record connections. Soon we'll be adding ROAR IDs, organization IDs for, uh, for affiliations. And we've, we've developed many, uh, many services uh, over the years um, with a, uh, uh, and just recently majorly updated similarity check, but also the REST API, Metadata Plus, um, and uh, event data, which we'll be hearing about later today as well. Uh, so as we've expanded and, uh, and added services and content, um, the, the landscape has changed. And so really that's, that's expanded the role that we have. So we're no longer just about bilateral relationships and, and efficiency in, in linking. Uh, the infrastructure is now uh, helping manage uh, <clears throat> multiple and multilateral relationships uh, in a network of other identifiers, metadata and relationships. And this means we're working much more closely with funders, with research organizations, which are academic institutions, universities, NGOs, uh, uh, researchers themselves, and of course, uh, uh, publishers and, 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 and being a, a point of trying to, and other infrastructure organizations as well, and trying trying to establish those, uh, those, those connections. So it puts us in a very, very interesting space. And the Crossref board was, uh, discussing these things uh, over the last uh, year. And uh, in, in July passed uh, a few motions uh, that are very uh, important and have sort of set us on this, uh, 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 some of these discussions that I'm gonna, gonna talk about now. So um, uh, the first one was that uh, about Crossref leading an effort to explore with other infrastructure organizations, how to improve the scholarly research ecosystem uh, but also committing Crossref to uh, uh, developing open scholarly infrastructure for the benefit of our members and the wider the wider research community. Uh, sorry, I'll just jump down here. I've pulled out the uh, the key bits here. Uh, so, uh, and we're uh, considering operational governance, technical product and service issues. So, pretty pretty broad look. We want to look at what's going on, talk to other organizations, uh, see what opportunities there are. Uh, and see how we can uh, uh, benefit the wider research community by working more closely together. And we set up a, a strategy committee uh, with the Crossref leadership team and some board members. And, uh, and actually we're reporting back to the board uh, uh, on Friday and the board is having a, a strategic board session uh, via Zoom on, uh, on Friday to talk about, to, to talk about some, of these, uh, some of these issues. So what's interesting as we as we look at this is we want to think about well what does open infrastructure actually mean? Uh, we can go back to uh, 2015 uh, paper uh, and uh, that outlined uh, some of the issues around open scholarly infrastructure and this has turned out to be uh, a pretty good guide for for the issue of open scholarly infrastructure. So it was something that uh, uh, Jeffrey Builder, who's uh, CTO at Crossref, uh, Jennifer Lin, who at the time was a product. Uh, director at Crossref and Ca uh, Cameron Nalen, uh, who many of you may know is a, a well-known uh, academic and researcher uh, and commenter on scholarly uh, communications. Uh, and uh, part of this was what they came up with was informed by uh, experience uh, creating the ORCID uh, uh, principles that ORCID used to, uh, to found. So, so these are looking at uh, governance, financial sustainability, and uh, community insurance. Now, these are uh, some of these are aspirational. It wasn't expected that everybody would meet all of these, but it's a good guideline and it's interesting to see uh, for organizations to look and see where they meet these and where they where they don't meet these. And so, you know, we do, Crossref does uh, very well on some of these. Uh, there's some of these we, we don't meet. I think, um, you know, uh, we do have broad coverage. We're, we're, we're global. We're stakeholder governed 
to, in the sense that all those organizations who are registering their content with us are members and participate in the governance. But as our, uh, as those organizations have started to expand and, and we're talking to some of these other infrastructure organizations, Crossref is still seen as a, a publisher led organization, which, which I would agree with that we are. Uh, that's worked really well. Uh, is, is that suitable going forward? That's one of the questions uh, we're, we're engaging with. Um, Crossref's always been very uh, transparent. Uh, we've, never, we've always been business model neutral and stayed away from policy issues. So we don't lobby. A couple of areas that are interesting for any organizations are considering a living will and incentives to wind down. Those, those are very difficult to actually put something concrete in place. So, so these are all things uh, uh, that we're looking at. Uh, but I think uh, we do very well on the financial sustainability uh, aspect. And then uh, we've got some more work to do on uh, using open source and, and some issues around uh, open data. So uh, this is an active on, ongoing discussion uh, that, uh, that we're engaged with and that we're talking to, uh, uh, to, to others about. So as we engage in some of these uh, discussions with other organizations, we wanna uh, just keep in our minds that you know, this is all about uh, making things easier and better for researchers and organizations involved in scholarly research and, and communication. That's, that's, that's the larger goal. Uh, we're looking to work with uh, infrastructure organizations uh, with aligned missions. Um, community governance is an issue. If you, if you look at a number of different organizations, uh, there are a whole class of activities now uh, that where, where funders, institution publishers, researchers themselves have an interest and, uh, and are involved. Um, and so that's important to keep in mind. Uh, Self-sustaining nonprofit business models are important, neutrality and independence, uh, open source solutions and, and, and services. And um, another key issue is working in the most efficient way possible, especially since uh, with, with, with the pandemic and uh, some of the financial pressures that uh, people and organizations are facing, uh, we want to reduce duplicative activities and, and, uh, and, and processes as we go, go forward. So just to give a little picture here, um, uh, we're doing a landscape survey. This is really just a, a, a first pass, but these are some of the organizations, some of the identifiers uh, that we are uh, either talking to or, 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 or thinking about. Uh, this is a rough, uh, a rough outline of going from sort of identifiers to systems and some of the services that, that uh, take the data and then visualize it and provide services around that. Uh, and um, uh, some newer initiatives as well, like a OA switchboard. And uh, there's, there, there's a lot going on, but you can also see that there's a lot of organizations involved too. And that's, that's one of the things we wanna think about. You know, there's uh, a term that's been used for a number of years in our space and that's uh, organizational fatigue. We can't, we can't create new organizations for every new initiative or every new identifier, uh, every new identifier that, uh, uh, that, that comes up. So uh, we're trying to uh, address that or, or, or factor that into our thinking uh, going forward. So just, just to highlight uh, again, in summary, some of the rationale behind uh, uh, the thinking around open scholarly infrastructure and what some of the next steps might be is that uh, there's certainly COVID related concerns. So economic pressures, uh, everyone's trying to balance out what's important and, re and reassess things. Um, there's organizational fatigue, as I mentioned. Uh, and so by working together, uh, we might be able to do more and do it more efficiently. Um, and uh, uh, that often there's a common vision uh, among uh, infrastructure organizations who, who already exist. We, we do collaborate with many organizations as you'll hear, uh, but, uh, but sometimes uh, we, as we differentiate the organizations, the, the message gets uh, uh, diluted a little bit. And uh, in the uh, theme of today, we're each smart alone, but we could, we could be brilliant uh, together. So this is an ongoing discussion. It's, it's in the ver very early stages. So uh, there'll be more to report on this as we, uh, as we go forward. And really just to end up with a vision looking forward, <clears throat> this came from a scholarly kitchen post from Amy Brand, who's former Crossref uh, staff person and now at MIT Press and on the Crossref board. Uh, what we're looking forward to is a more robust, inclusive, and innovative space. 
It could be Crossref as an organization. It could be Crossref turned into something new or some some new entity. Uh, and uh, but we want to uh, create and sustain core infrastructures for sharing, preserving, and evaluating research uh, research information. So uh, I think it's important to have that long term goal and then uh, keep that in mind as we uh, go about our 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 day to day things and 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 adjust to uh, this uh, this new world that we find ourselves in. So thank you very much. I think I will uh, stop there. Ed, thank you and thank you for um we're, we're we're doing well in terms of in terms of time up to um to this point um i know that um Ginny hendrix is up next um so before i pass over to Ginny, can i just ask see so I've got one question that's come up. So why don't we cover that before? Um, why don't we cover that before Ginny's um, section, and then um, we've got time to do that. So there's a question just um, about our publisher registers DOIs for our journals and preprints, but how can a society or nonprofit easily and at a reasonable cost obtain DOIs for self-published works such as eBooks or white papers? Um, uh, oh, so I guess that's that's for me. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess for any, we, we could we could come. It, it's also sort of I, I think it sort of sits fairly broadly across, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so yeah. So I mean, in in terms of uh, 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 a, a membership that that often societies and uh, organizations yeah work 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 through a publisher who who publishes the content, at, or or sometimes they they act 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 through a a, a service provider as as well. So. Um, uh, you can uh, an organization can registering at register things directly as well uh, that that they if, if you have e ebooks or, or or white papers so so if you're already participating with 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 the publisher uh, it wouldn't it wouldn't shouldn't be very difficult to uh, uh, to uh, uh, you know uh, do the other content as well uh, and and you, there may be a prefix that they're using for you that you can that you can just reuse. So so yeah, get if you get in touch with our uh, membership team, uh, they they can get you know help help get you get you set up for that. And and uh, you know so your your membership might already be covered through uh, participating with that with that publisher. So, but it'll vary depending on your case. Yeah, I will pass on just the email, the sort of direct email of our membership team as well, because they'll, um, they, this is the kind of thing I think that they, they sort of deal with a lot and trying to find the kind of right fit and the right setup for organizations. And um, so they'll certainly be able to help sort of with your kind of unique circumstance and talk about sort of who you're working with already and what costs might be involved. So Ginny, can I hand over to you? Now we can see your screen and everything fine. Cool, thank you. Thanks for the question because that gave me time to set that up okay. Um, I'll have my video on just to say hello, but then I'll turn it off because it'll be annoying for everybody, including me. Um, but I'm Ginny Hendricks, Director of Member and Community Outreach. Um, and I've been with Crossref since 2015. So just over five years. And um, we had the uh, member and community outreach team uh, newly established at that point, and it's grown um, to uh, quite a large team of around 15 people. And these are some of the uh, uh, areas in which our team operates. And I wanted to just go through that a little bit because people think of outreach as just membership or just talking to people. And in fact, uh, we're a very, very broad group. We have um, uh, our head of metadata, Patricia. So we're looking at our strategy for um, 
content types, constantly listening to members and users of our metadata to figure out where they're going, where their publishing workflows are going so that we can um, uh, plan for that, uh, update our input schema and look at how that metadata is being used um, so that we can update our, our API. So working really closely with the product team in that area as well. Um, we also have, um, of course, the membership group, and uh, I'll show a chart just in a minute that shows just how fast our membership is growing. Uh, so new applications and onboarding, where it used to be sort of half a person, is now um, a combination of quite a few people, including um, outsourced freelance help uh, when needed as well. So we're constantly looking at how we can scale better, automate a lot of these uh, new members uh, being able to join and helping them along the way so that we in turn hopefully reduce the burden on our technical support group which is also in in this outreach team uh, and they're responsible for supporting all of the services um, they answer something like 4,000 uh, tickets a month uh, and there's three of them at the moment and we're also looking to expand that to use outsourced um, freelance help soon. Um, they also um, uh, work closely with the product team um, to uh, kind of escalate uh, any bugs, uh, help, uh, help them look at what the key issues are for members and you'll know them uh, if you're if you're a member or a user by name, Isaac, Shane, or Paul, um, they're they're known very well to our members, I think, and um, we've managed to be able to keep to answering questions within about two or three days at the moment, and hoping to keep to that as as we scale up. Um, so we so on the community outreach side, we run events like this, and um, and that's Susan and Vanessa primarily, with Rosa um, also uh, on the communications side. Um, and we don't have a, a marketing function as, as such, uh, but we try to have as much useful information easily findable and available on our website. Um, and the community outreach team also works with the sponsors that was just mentioned. Um, and they are a significant group of partners that um, tend to be non-Western, I would say, um, non-English. Uh, language uh, native and um, they are sort of interacting with Crossref on behalf of a number of smaller organizations. And we have two new areas now, um, as, as Ed has um, introduced, we're doing a lot more um, collaborations uh, that, than we used to and, and in a more kind of structured and, and formal way. So we have a head of partnerships, that's Jennifer Kemp. She looks after um, a number of uh, organizations that whose, whose involvement with Crossref is really impactful and sort of works hand in hand with them to help them um, you know, understand new services that are coming and, you know, improve their participation. Um, she works with the platforms um, and also the um, uh, Metadata Plus subscribers, so paying users of our uh, metadata service. And Rachel uh, will probably introduce herself later and she will talk all about some of our special programs. That's a slightly new area, formerly known as Strategic Initiatives. Um, Okay, so here are some of the, it's very brightly colourful, I'm sorry, um, some of the organisations that we now work with. Of course, when we started, there's that darker grey um, a bit in the middle that was publishers, and then we saw more societies join, university presses. Um, we started to see, um, you know, the odd museum or pharmaceutical company join, but they really were outliers. And more and more, the trends have been the last few years to see a lot more um, library led uh, publishers and scholar led uh, publishing joining Crossref. Um, we also see authors setting up their own, um, setting up their own journals. So there's a lot more, if you like, consultation we have to do if someone wants to start a journal. And it's not just about, you know, getting a DOI for their articles. We have to do quite a bit of um, uh, back and forth so that they understand exactly what their obligations are. Um, 
and things like that. And you'll notice the funders on the bottom. We have, um, I think, about 20 funder members now, and about half of those have just joined in the last year. And four of those are already registering grants metadata with us. Uh, and that's been one of our special programs um, involving metadata schema work uh, with working groups. It's involved um, a lot of outreach and discussion, a lot of um, uh, kind of alignment with partners like DataSite uh, on the schema. And that was rolled out last year. And so we're starting to see, starting to see those, those come in now. Here's the aforementioned chart of the um, new members joining Crossref each year. So, so these numbers, you'll see that that's 2019 is the last number there, 2,511. That was the number of new members that joined in 2019. Um, so we have over 12,000 in total. And as you can see, each year since we started, we really were able to have, you know, half an FTE uh, welcoming new members and getting them kind of set up in our systems and things like that. And now we're doing it at, at quite a significant scale with uh, around 200 members per month joining. Um, actually, another interesting trend is that m more new members now are joining through a sponsor, so somebody that can help them in their local language with technical support than are joining directly. Um, so they're, yeah, they're really important and they, we, they work closely with us to help sort of translate documentation and things like that. Um, here's a chart showing where these new members are coming from. Um, Indonesia jumps out there. They uh, currently make up, um, sorry, this is the new members joining. So in 2019, a third of our new members came from Indonesia and they now account for a, about 10% of our full membership. Um, so working with a specific country, understanding their government mandates, understanding their sort of um, the landscape of, of academia and publishing there requires quite a lot of kind of input and, and um, uh, discussion uh, by my team. And we still see lots of new members joining from um, the traditional, um, you know, original membership countries like, like Western Europe and the United States. So um, these countries have been trending, I suppose, upwards for quite a few years. So Indonesia, South Korea, Turkey and Brazil and um, uh, yeah. The other trend I don't have a chart for yet, but um, I might share it on Twitter afterwards, is that most of our members now have around 100 DOI. So that is now what a typical Crossref member is. It isn't um, an organization that has, uh, you know, even, even in, in, in the thousands of content types, but just 100. Um, and that's even in, even excluding newer members that have just joined in the last year. So a really different profile of Crossref membership than even five years ago. Um, so uh, sort of alluding to what, what um, Ed was saying earlier about expanding um, and broadening our governance um, and looking at how we can move forward. We've, we have had a few nudges in that direction over the years. Um, recently in, in 2017, we updated our mission statement um, to say that we make research outputs, so not, um, you know, scholarly articles specifically, but research outputs, easy to find, site link, assess, and reuse was added. That's uh, a nod to our growing role and importance in distributing the metadata that members register um, with us for the purposes of distributing um, to in increase discoverability of their work. Um, we also updated the membership definitions in 2018. And um, so the eligibility now to become a member of Crossref is that you are an organization that produces content. And, and, and that's not published content, that's produced because we didn't want to just limit to uh, text uh, content, for example. And so that's defined as professional and scholarly materials. So that gives us scope in the future to um, register things like protocols or methods or um, other sort of objects that are not just outputs, but inputs um, throughout the research uh, process. 
And um, more recently, we've also expanded our membership and fees committee, which is sort of a, a board delegated committee. They look at um, policies around um, terms of different services, and they also make recommendations about fees. And that was always um, just for members. But as of this year, we now have a funder, a sponsor and a platform, as well as publishers. And it's, it's, a, it's a slightly bigger group as well. So we're going to be able to make decisions and recommendations to the board um, that are a bit more representative of all of the groups that work with Crossref. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that that was a little bit of a, um, a status update of, of where we are and um, what's what's happening with Crossref membership and the community. And I, I wanted just to, to take a moment to just talk about that word community, which people use a lot. Um, so we've been starting to think, well, what does that actually mean um, and what does it mean for us? Um, and for us, it really um, is when you look at the definitions of community, it isn't just a user group or people that use your service. That might be a community of practice, people who are maybe production managers and register, compile and register XML. That might be a community of practice and they're sort of like a user group. They um, are learning how to improve that skill. Um, and I'm not sure they have a passion for XML, but actually you'd be surprised a lot of them do. Um, but there's also these other aspects of community around sort of kinship and an attribute of, of kinship and affinity is that you see high levels of sharing. Um, and that's something that we keep in mind and really want to aspire to at, at Crossref. Um, and collectivism as well, the concept or the idea that, um, that, that people will prioritise the the benefits for the entire group over the benefits for oneself, for one's own organization. So common values and goals. Um, and this is always a huge balance at, at Crossref, as Ed mentioned. Um, but we are trying to balance all of those different needs and bring the common values and goals together. Um, another, another word we hear a lot and talk about a lot is collaboration. And so what does that really mean um, for us? Uh, for us, it, it means we're actually working together with somebody else to produce something. So um, that could be something technical, it could be a tool, it could be an integration, or it could be a, a white paper where we're, we're, where we're co-authoring with, with colleagues at other organizations. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we can talk a lot about collaboration, but we also have to be really, um, uh, you know, have a lot of humility around it because Crossref isn't the center of, of, um, of the research community at all. And there are others that have, uh, you know, different perspectives and skills and resources. So I really want um, Crossref to start looking to those other organizations as we're collaborating, not being a hub, um, but really seeing the community as, um, you know, interacting with each other using Crossref where needed rather than coming to Crossref as a hub. And there's also a point because it's about people a lot, um, it means it's about, um, you know, communication and it also means it's about trust. So true collaborations uh, and successful collaborations are the ones where you have a high level of trust, um, you know, we've shared um, details about our governance, we've shared details about our finances, and that's how we're going to establish really successful collaborations in future. Um, so some of the other ways in which we collaborate, um, there's lots of examples and um, Rachel will, will go into, into those later on um, in this session. Um, but of course we advise, we also listen and learn from others. Uh, sometimes we are incubating a tool and we might prototype something for another organization. A lot of these things don't necessarily see the light of day, but they help others along their path. Um, so we might we might be on the board of other organizations and we might uh, chair working groups. Um, so we're very involved in those kinds of ways. Sometimes we actually resource things. We might second a developer to another, another um, like-minded organization. Um, and we might uh, even you know, financially support um, a similar organization as well. That's happened in the past, for example, with ORCID and um, 
you know, that's something that we would consider in the future as well. Uh, so here are some of the, <laughs> this is, Rachel accused me of putting a slide in that was a sticker sneeze. Uh, so yes, this is our sticker sneeze <laughs> for, the, for the afternoon. Um, these are some of the initiatives and uh, organisations that I would say we are truly collaborating with uh, and through where we're actively involved in producing something. Um, and uh, I won't go through them all, but happy to answer any questions about any of these. Uh, some of them, some of them very established and some of them um, very new. Um, and just to end my session, I'm sure I've gone over. I wanted to just talk about this chart, this model for um, community collaboration and engagement. Um, so we've been working with the Centre for Scientific Collaboration and Community Engagement, the CSCCE, um, and they have helped us understand and we, we've worked with them to um, come up with this or refine this model where we would like to get to. Um, I mentioned we don't have a marketing department. We don't want to in future just produce things to inform. Uh, we want to create things together. Um, and that involves, you know, not necessarily leading on everything. Perhaps in the future, we will see self-organized committees and self-organized working groups around Crossref services. Um, and there's also a point there about the power balance. Is Crossref considered an expert in an area or are we sort of a scaffolded cooperation where others can input and we can actually mutually share and learn um, very equally with others? So we are trying to get more to that transformational stage where um, things are co-created. So developed and, you know, materials written and um, we're just really starting on, on this path, but I thought it would be um, interesting to share where we're heading in the community outreach team. And that is my bit done, I think. It is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ginny. What I will do now is I'm going to, I'm going to move over just to, to keep us to time. I'm going to move over to, um, a uh, presentation by um, Patricia Feeney, who's our head of our head of metadata. I'm going to do that via um, I'm going to do that via video. Patricia's made a recording. She is on the call as well, um, but this is just to to guard against any um, any potential Wi-Fi issues, um, which which as you know are, uh, are are sort of a consequence of 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 working from home all the time. So I'm going to bring this up and share it now. Okay, let me let me pause and try to get the sound running. Um, let me see. Good morning. I am going to discuss the research nexus. But first, um, I thought I'd talk a bit about my house. Um, I'm the head of metadata at Crossref, um, and it's my job to evolve our metadata in a way that makes sense for our community. Um, we are maturing a bit as an organization, and I think about this a lot. Um, also, like so many of us, I've been spending a lot of time at home, and I think about my house a lot. Um, so I can't help but draw parallels between that and what I do now that I spend so much time at home. Um, we're going to be adding support for new types of metadata and expanding uh, 
just the scope of what we collect and that presents a lot of challenges. Um, we have a very complex system that ingests this metadata that's been around for over 20 years, which I think makes it the equivalent of my 120 year old house. It has good bones and has sheltered families for generations, but it has limitations. The wiring has been upgraded, but has it really been done well? I don't know. Uh, it needs better insulation, but to do that the right way, you need to knock down the walls and that would disrupt our lives in ways that we don't want. Uh, so there's a lot to think about. Um, under our roof at Crossref, we have records for defined sets of content. Many of you are familiar with this. Journals, books, standards, preprints. Uh, for many years, we registered mainly articles for our members, um, plus books and conference proceedings to a lesser degree, but we've been expanding that quite a bit. Um, comparatively, we have a small number of preprints, but that category is going, growing quickly. Some types of content have been with us for a while. Some are new. Some are very new, all are growing, um, some more than others. Uh, it's interesting to look at the rate. Um, as you can see here, preprints are growing quite a bit um, as our peer reviews, and that makes a lot of sense because they're very new and um, we're acquiring new members who are able to register a lot of these types of content. They also tend to have a, just a high volume in general of um, you know, every journal article has several reviews, so it makes sense that, that we'll, we'll see a bit of a bump for that. Um, I also think it's an interesting to look into what comprises our corpus of metadata records. Um, unfortunately, I don't have numbers for grants, which are a newer content type, um, but I, I, I don't want you to think I'm ignoring them because they're very important. Um, journal articles historically are a very big deal but they're inching down in total coverage. Books are increasing, but overall, I think it's the breadth of content we support that's making a big difference. And it'll be interesting to see where we are five years from now. And of course, all of these types of content are related. It could be the people involved with creating the content, the researchers. It could be the organizations involved in funding them. Um, we know an article is an important mature research object, but how does a book chapter relate to a funder, a preprint, a data set? We think of in and out, this goes into a journal article, this comes out in hierarchies, but we want to make other, co co connect, other connections just as clear. These DOI to DOI connections really help us form a research nexus, connecting all of these scattered but related items. We see a ton of materials closely connected to publications, um, like versions of a publication, reviews, data sets, software packages, protocols, um, conference posters, and more. And occasionally these items are have a direct link to a publication, but rarely are these relationships made available beyond the publisher platform. And when they are available, it's not in a standardized way. Um, so our metadata really has the potential to link within records to create a web of connections from researchers by ORCID IDs, their affiliation, affiliated organizations um, through ROAR identifiers, um, connecting funders, grants, posters, conferences, all linked together in ways that can be easily navigated. And so we're really beginning to make these connections available to the broader research ecosystem, but there's a lot of work to do. When publishers register content for a publication, they can identify the associated scholarly objects directly in the article metadata. We can also increasingly make other connections. We began registering grants over a year ago. This helps connect funders to research objects, but also makes a wealth of funding data machine readable across funders. So for grants, we're collecting information on who's associated with grant funded projects. Um, we include ORCID IDs and ROAR IDs to help cement those connections. We've also worked with our funders to create a taxonomy of funding types that will be refined as we go forward. We'll also soon begin registering identifiers for conferences. This is a joint effort with Datasite. Um, we currently register DOIs for conference proceedings and papers, but we're expanding that to identify conference events themselves. Um, identification metadata can help with efforts to define, identify predatory conferences, 
and we'll also connect events with proceedings, posters, videos, and other conference materials. We're also expanding our metadata schema soon to include, include affiliation identifiers like ROAR, um, and we'll be accepting other identifiers for contributors, organizations, and within citations. Um, so back to the whole house idea. So we intend to expand the metadata and content su we support. How do we do that? Um, this is really essential, much like a kitchen, an important part of any house. Uh, right now, I feel like our kitchen at Crossref has a lot of gadgets, maybe, but maybe not enough ingredients and a poor layout that makes it hard to cook up the best meal. So um, there are ways we can address this. For example, journal articles are essential, and we collect a lot of article met metadata. Many publishers already have comprehensive metadata in JATS, so we need to work more with the JATS standard and make our metadata more co compatible and maybe down the road even accept map JATS directly. So instead of, you'd say, adopting their jets, like you adopt a recipe for a microwave, they can use um, a stove for their article met and metadata like they originally intended. Um, we also make the case for our members, um, we also really need to make the case to our members to supply more complete metadata. Um, so we want to tap into the work Metadata 2020 has done and, um, we also want to make the most of other um, relationships with other uh, persistent identifier organizations. So in your household, if you're really lucky, you can have a nice garden. Um, at Crossref, we want to grow support for wider types of metadata. We have a lot of fertile ground and seedlings waiting to flourish, but we also need to make sure the prep work is done before things can grow the right way. Right now, new things are on our horizon are collecting more information on open access status, um, data availability statements, accessibility info, and, and more. We also want to um, support newer types of content like blogs, posters, and um, some videos. So I want to talk a bit about the relationship metadata we collect. Um, relations, they um, create a defined path free of obstacles. Uh, we support creating relationships using records by a, a defined taxonomy of relationship types. Um, we want to make providing and identifying these commonplace and allow these relations to be asserted freely. Um, right now, it's a little tricky. We want you to move freely between objects and enjoy the experience and uh, find it useful. Um, that way that, you know, with direct relationships, you can connect a conference to funding an institution to posters, protocols, and more. Currently, this uh, set of metadata that we collect is small, but it's growing and will continue to grow. Um, if you, we dig a little deeper into it, these are the top 10 relations we collect. Um, this is just a general search of our API to see what the most common relations are. Um, most are from uh, peer reviews, and uh, they'll most of them point from a peer, a peer review to a journal article. Uh, the second most common are preprints, linking from a preprint to a journal article. Um, the third top relation is the is identical relation, which is um, used within our um, books for our um, coaxis service um, but it, moving uh, moving a bit down you'll see there's there's is common on um, is replied to has reply is supplemented by these are all uh, relations that our members have provided to us directly um, so i've just started really digging into our relation metadata and there are some things that make a lot of sense and seem really object seem really obvious. Um, the most of the relationships we have now are inserted by Crossref or are required or heavily encouraged by our best practices. You know, so the, the um, linking from a preprint to a journal article, we don't insert that ourselves, but we do. Um, it, 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 it's it's a best practice for our preprint uh, registrants to do that. Um, so that means, you know, most relationships are from preprints to journal articles or from reviews to journal articles. Um, and 
if you dig a little further into the relation metadata, you'll see that the bulk of the relation metadata are provided by a small number of members. So we really hope to grow that in the future and make it easier for people to identify and send these relations to us. Um, some of the things that don't make a lot of sense, I think the thing that made me scratch my hat head a bit was that um, within the relations metadata, data sets have the most relationships. I would think that the most relationships would be within preprints or peer review, but it's actually data sets. And the um, highest number um, within data sets are, is review of, but there's actually quite a wide variety. They actually use um, within data sets, maybe 13 relations, which is um, more than other, within other content types. So since it's almost October, I thought I'd finish up by telling you a scary tale of what dwells in Crossref at, Crossref at, Crossref's attic. Um, like every house at Crossref, we have a place where we shove things we don't know what to do with. They are there when we need them, but you have to dig for them, and maybe they don't get, and maybe they get damaged if they aren't stored property, uh, properly. If they aren't fully discoverable, metadata records get neglected, forgotten. They aren't used to their full potential. It can be a really scary place. You don't know what is behind the shadow at the corner of your eye. You don't really know what's going on. It's chaos. It's crazy. Not really. But um, over the years, data sets and components have become the place to stash something you don't really know what else to do, what else to do with. They're like our attic. So if someone wants to register something we don't fully support, it gets dumped in data sets as the metadata is fairly generic. That um, applies to components as well because they're flexible. The only requirement for components is that they are a component of something. So they have to be part of a larger object. So they have to be associated with a journal article or book chapter or something like that. Um, it's not a huge problem numbers wise. Uh, data sets comprise one and a half percent of our total records, components almost four percent, but that's still millions of records that aren't fully realized and I think they give us an idea of where we need to go in many ways. The big issue with these is that we don't know what they are. Um, this is basically a failure of metadata. Often the metadata registered isn't adequate and by default the records are identified as data sets or components. So until you actually follow a DOI link, um, you often can't tell um, what a data set or component record really is. Um, so I thought I'd look at a few just to, to illustrate this point. Um, here's a really good example of something that's been stashed in our attic. Um, this is a case rec record from a handbook. Um, you can register this sort of thing as a book chapter. So I'm not sure why this is in our attic and not in the whatever house part of the house we keep our books in. Oh, the library, I guess. <laughs> so if you look at this DOI in our metadata search interface, it's flagged as a data set. So our metadata users who retrieve books won't find it and citation formatters won't format it properly. So I rank this as pretty scary. Um, five out of ten or six out of ten actually because it's registered and it has basic metadata, so it's somewhat useful, but it probably should have been registered as a book. Um, you know, it's basically, um, it's got its Halloween costume, it's dressed up on, it's dressed up as something that it isn't. So how scary is this? Um, this would be much better in per person, but um, I could have you raise hands and stuff, but oh well. Um, this is another example. I don't know what it is. I don't know who James C. Dezao is, I have no idea. So I clicked on this link and this is what I found. So I'd say this is the scariest, one of the scariest records I've seen, um, aside from things that were registered in like 2003 and have no titles or whatever. This is, this is pretty scary. It, I don't know what it is. I don't know what it links to. It's pretty useless. Um, how scary is this record? Well, I'm happy to report that this is, this is not scary at all. This is actually a perfect data set record. It's a, it's a data set. It, the link works. Um, I, I know these, these screenshots don't show the full metadata, but the metadata is all there. It's a good thing. Finally, um, this example is an example of a component record. A component, as I mentioned, is part of a whole. 
So if you want to assign a DOI to a figure or a table or supplemental material or a demo associated with the paper, you can register it as a component. You can't tell from the metadata we display, but um, this object is a figure within a journal article. So someone can use this DOI to cite this figure directly. So that's a good thing. So I've rated this as both good and bad because the publisher is registering figures according to what we allow and recommend, but our support doesn't really extend to what we need in the present day. Uh, components work for figures and tables. Um, if you don't want to make them more discoverable or don't need to, but a lot of materials that we formally regarded as supplemental to a journal article may benefit from being more discoverable. Um, as we know, research isn't just journal articles. Um, so a demo software video was created by researchers to present their research, but um, it's, it, it really, we'd like it to step out and be part, more part of a, um, the research nexus than just hiding behind, behind a journal article and um, relying on um, kind of secondary discovery. So to sum that up, um, there's nothing really scary in our attic. We just need to clean it up and make it work. Um, we want to take steps towards figuring out what is being registered, um, figuring out what needs to be registered, and how we can best register everything, how we can make this work for our members. Um, so there are some odds and ends mixed in that may be the missing links that we need to fully realize our research nexus. So I hope, um, hopefully we'll have um, more information out soon about this research nexus idea. Thank you. Okay, so I think, so we've come up to, um, we've come up to 10.30. Brian, I can, I can see your screen clearly, everything, everything looks well. So I think with, um, I think with the aim of kind of keeping to keeping to the agenda and keeping to time, um, we'll start the second session now. So Brian, who's our director of product, is going to talk about um, some of the the work that his team's been doing at, at Crossref over the over the past little while. Uh, All yours. Great, thanks, Rachel. Um, hello, everyone. Um, as Rachel said, I, I'm Brian Vickery, director of product at Crossref. Um, quite a lot has changed in the product team uh, in the last year. Um, I haven't included myself on this slide, but um, I joined Crossref um, back in August last year. Um, the team was just three at that point in time, and uh, I <coughs> set about hiring a couple of uh, new and very talented uh, people. Um, Martin will talk to you um, a little bit later on, um, but Sarah Bowman joined the team from the Center for Open Science, uh, where she was working on some very uh, complex uh, workflows and uh, led a large kind of uh, UI UX um, redesign of some of the services there, um, which makes her perfect for what I will um, talk about in a second uh, to do with content registration. Um, uh, Martin joined us uh, where he was an open access publisher at MDPI. Um, he's based in Germany and uh, he has a very uh, strong background in preprints. Uh, he launched a preprint server uh, with MDPI. I should have said Sarah is based in the east coast of the US. Um, so Martin's looking after um, things that we've termed scholarly um, impact. Um, so our event data service um, cited by um, the tool that a lot of you use um, to un understand the citation impact of your of your work. Um, he's also looking after distributed usage logging and because of his background and preprints. Um, Kirsty Meddings has been at Crossref for, for a long time. Um, she's well known to many of you. Um, she's looked after many products um, in her time, uh, but she's currently looking after what we've called scholarly stewardship. Um, so the tools and services that our members use to steward their content over time, including similarity check and cross mark, which we've heard quite a bit about already. Um, participation reports, which I know you all, you all love your own participation report and you love looking at other members' participation reports. There's a lot of work for us to, to do there. Um, she also looks after the um, tools we have for um, multiple resolution of DOIs and for co-access, uh, predominantly for books. And she looks after our funder registry um, as well. 
Um, she's based here in the UK um, with me. Um, Rakesh is also in the UK. He's a, a UX and UI designer. And he's doing quite a lot of work at the moment on something I've put in quotes as the admin center. I don't, I know this is being recorded, but don't hold me to that. I'll try and explain what that is in a minute. Um, and Patrick is based on the west coast of the US and he looks after um, all of the metadata retrieval options. So all of the Crossref um, uh, retrieval APIs, uh, Crossref metadata plus service uh, and uh, things like Orchid, up to Orchid um, auto update. Um, so given the team is relatively new, um, we joined up with the technology team um, from the beginning. Uh, they were involved in a very large knowledge transfer project last year um, because the previous uh, technology director was retiring at the end of 2019. Um, and so we, we joined forces with them uh, to really understand, to take the time to understand and document everything that Crossref does, or uh, at least the things that we can find that aren't in the attic. Um, we uh, started a strategic review process uh, of every single one of our um, products, if you like, uh, services and tools, all of the uh, help apps that we provide to our members uh, so that we could really go back into history and uh, look at why we, uh, why we embarked upon those projects, um, what they were trying to achieve, whether that was still relevant uh, in the current time uh, to gather data on how well they were being used or not being used and uh, to seek uh, feedback from you, uh, the members or the service providers um, that register content or use Crossref um, metadata. Um, there are some services like Cited By um, where members register references within their content, uh, but they don't make use of um, the Cited By service. Uh, so we've managed to get some data on that and Martin's talking to them um, about the use of, of, of that tool. Um, and also out of those strategic reviews, I think this is very important um, to highlight some of the things that we uh, should stop doing uh, because they're not used or, or they're not needed anymore so that we can really truly focus on the things that, that we needed to do. Um, I say we've completed the majority of those um, product reviews and they were really, really insightful. Um, the team has gained a huge amount of knowledge um, over the last six months doing these. Uh, we've got a couple more to do um, on co-access and multiple resolution uh, and also cross-ref metadata search, um, but the others are completed now. Um, and off the back of those, we have um, reinvigorated a couple of our working groups or advisory groups, so the similarity check um, advisory group has been refreshed and has started to meet again um, to talk about uh, the new version of Similarity Check, which is coming soon. And um, we also refresh the advisory group for the distributed usage logging um, project. More on that on a bit in in a, in a few minutes. Um, and we really started to take an outcomes-driven approach to to product prioritization. So looking at the things that would be most impactful for our, for our members. Um, Patrick has uh, kind of formally taken on our Scrum Master role, if you like, 50% uh, of his time now is managing that process. Uh, and he's really improved the, uh, the sprint planning and sprint um, delivery processes. So I think we're starting to make some really great progress um, around that. And of course, everything we do um, at the moment is, is, is to make it easier and more efficient for our members um, to, to work with Crossref, to register um, the highest quality metadata they can um, so that that becomes useful for those that want to uh, retrieve and, and consume, that, consume that metadata. In terms of simplifying our existing services. And um, I haven't put any screenshots on this um, because I don't want to, um, uh, I don't want to promise things or over promise things. Um, but um, out of that research, um, we, we understood that we provide a lot of reports, different types of reports to our members um, on what they're registering with us and what they're linking together and what is failing and not working properly. Um, we have title lists where they can see uh, volumes and issues and the number of DOIs registered against those and look for gaps. Um, 
we have a lot of interfaces. Um, so five or six different mechanisms for registering metadata. Not all of them are in sync with, with one another. So you can achieve different things using different mechanisms. Um, we have a lot of helper apps, um, such as the simple text query where you can um, match references um, and then add them to your, to your metadata. Um, and all of that leads to quite a lot of support requests. I think Ginny mentioned this earlier on. It's about 4,000 requests a month. Uh, the team of three there is, is dealing with. And some of those are because members um, can't do what they uh, want to do themselves and they need to contact uh, staff at Crossref to be able to do that. Um, the idea is that uh, we're planning for a new um, admin, admin centre, um, which will bring the reports, um, the interfaces and apps into a, into a unified Crossref experience. And that's something that we're going to be um, getting your feedback on over the next over the next few months. So we'll, we'll certainly put out a blog post before the end of the year with some of our um, uh, initial plans for doing that. But it's 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 aimed to allow you to better understand what you're registering and um, to help you to register that in a, in a more complete uh, way with higher quality. Also, uh, to do with simplifying services, I guess, um, is this, uh, we've evolved our support for text and data mining. Um, so back in 2014, we kicked off a project to support members and researchers with, with text and data mining requests. And that had two main parts to it. Um, the first was collecting in the metadata uh, full text links for, for text and data mining, as well as the licenses associated with that. And we have 38 million um, works in Crossref at the moment, which have both the text and data mining link uh, and a text and data mining license, which is fantastic. And that's contributed by more than 700, um, that's contributed by more than 700 of our members. And we continue to encourage all of our members to include those links and licensing information to allow researchers to know what, um, what's available um, and what the licensing conditions are uh, for that. I think Ed mentioned um, that um, earlier in the year, driven really by uh, COVID, but I guess it's relevant to any um, disaster or pandemic or, or, or major issue. A lot of our members want to either permanently or temporarily make content available free to read. Um, we, we worked very quickly, um, I think back in April um, to, uh, make that possible so uh, a member can include a, a free to read element in the access uh, indicates section of their metadata um, and then researchers can find that information through the uh, through the APIs. Um, 85,000 um, works uh, piece of content have been marked as free to read uh, in that short period of time which is which is really great. Um, the other part of our support for um, text and data mining was a um, uh, called a TDM click through service. Uh, basically, it was a, a registry of text and data mining licenses that uh, a researcher could log in with their ORCID ID and accept those additional licenses that our members were making available. Um, and then receive a token, and they would use that token um, in their API calls to gain access to the to the content. Um, a lot has changed with text and data mining in in the last few years, not least the UK and EU copyright exceptions for um, text and data mining, um, but also because members have um, really improved the methods and mechanisms they make available to researchers for text and data mining. Um, as part of the strategic review of our projects, um, text and data mining click-through service came up um, as only having two publishers taking part. Uh, so there are just two licenses there for researchers to uh, accept and uh, just 300 tokens over the five or six years of the life of the project. And so um, at the end of this year, we're going to sunset this service, um, still maintaining our support uh, for text and data mining through the full uh, through the text and data mining links and licensing information, um, but sunsetting the, the click through service because it simply didn't um, meet the needs. 
in terms of improving metadata, um, I think abstracts has already come up um, today as, as one of the key key areas. Um, last week at the OASPA conference, um, the initiative for open abstracts was launched. Um, this is an initiative which is calling on publishers to make abstracts um, openly available by registering them in, in Crossref so that they can be um, retrieved by, by researchers and others through the APIs. Um, just to give you some kind of day one statistics, um, uh, there are abstracts for set around six to seven percent of all works um, with the publication dates stretching back to the start of time. Um, for journal articles, that's 8.5 percent, and we can imagine that um, that's where a lot of the abstracts will be. Um, for, for journal articles with a publication date of 2020, um, already 24% of the um, works, the journal articles have an abstract associated with them. And um, if you are a publisher, a uh, publisher member of Crossref, you can view your participation report and see how, um, how well you are, you are doing. And if you're interested um, in, if you don't have abstracts or there are gaps, then uh, you can update that through your uh, usual content registration mechanism. Uh, contact the I4OA um, group if you're interested in joining up as a, as a signatory. The other things which are coming up uh, to do with improving metadata, I think um, Patricia's already mentioned um, the schema changes that we hope to uh, make available by the end of this year um, will support um, organization identifiers through RAW and also uh, improve support for uh, contributors uh, through, through credit plus some other things as well. Um, and another initiative that we're planning, and you know, the, more, uh, the more our metadata is consumed, uh, retrieved, uh, the more eyes there are on that metadata. And the process for um, spotting and fixing um, incorrect metadata or problems with that metadata is a little bit patchy. So we're starting the groundwork at the moment to uh, develop a mechanism, a tool for uh, better handling that uh, metadata feedback. So a user would be able to um, enter their feedback to, to say what was wrong with a piece of uh, metadata and Crossref would then um, manage that uh, toing and froing handshake, if you like, with the, with the publisher, with the member to try to get that corrected. Uh, in terms of improving our uh, services, the, uh, our, our APIs serve more than 600 million requests a month, uh, and, and that's um, continuing to grow. We've had a project for around a year now um, to migrate uh, from Solar to Elasticsearch uh, to address uh, some scalability and extensibility um, challenges that we have with, with serving that many, um, that many requests. And that's meant that we've had a, a code freeze on the API. Um, that means that you can't currently um, uh, find grant information, for example, through the Crossref REST API. Uh, I'm really pleased to say that we've made fantastic progress on this over the last uh, couple of months. And uh, we're hoping that this will also be switched over. The, the new API will be in place before the end of this year. And we've deliberately um, we've deliberately uh, designed it, built it in such a way that it is a uh, feature parity with the, with the old Solar REST API so that the queries that uh, researchers and users uh, already have in place will continue to work. So once that's done um, before the end of the year, then we'll add in um, support for the content types which are currently missing from the, from the API. Um, we also have some updates uh, coming for similarity check. Uh, I know quite a lot of uh, you will be using similarity check. Um, I think a thousand, about a thousand Crossref members currently um, currently use it as a service. It's a it's a tool that's provided through uh, uh, an organisation called Turnitin, and the product is called Authenticate. And there's a version two of Authenticate, um, which is uh, it's just finished beta testing by the cross, well, the user testing by the Crossref staff and uh, is about to go into beta testing. Um, so if any of you are similarity check users and you use it natively, that is logging in directly to authenticate um, rather than 
accessing similarity check through a manuscript um, tracking system. And if you use it natively and you're interested in taking part in the early testing phases for the new version of Authenticate, then, uh, then please drop us a line, uh, maybe in the chat, um, and uh, we can talk to you about getting access to the, to the, new, the new version. Uh, there's a lot of great new features. There's a brand new um, PDF viewer for the um, similarity check uh, content report. Um, it's, it's designed uh, with more accessibility and it's searchable. You can copy and paste parts of it out um, if you need to. Um, if you need to use that information to send to somebody else, um, you can now uh, exclude various um, uh, parts of the content uh, on the fly and it will dynamically update um, and each each publisher will have their own um, each member ha now has their own content portal um, which uh, explains to you how much of your content is currently indexed in Authenticate and uh, it will also show you where there are errors um, in indexing so that's a really useful tool so that you can make sure that all of your content is making it um, into similarity check um, also, there's a great new API um, which allows you as a member to do a lot more with the report or with the information that's coming back. And that leads us on to the integration with manuscript tracking systems. So uh, we're currently working with Editorial Manager and Scholar One, uh, eJournal Press, um, OJS, uh, to um, upgrade to uh, integrate with version two of the API. Um, I can't currently give you the plans for that. I think eJournal Press are on the call. I think they're ahead of most of the other uh, manuscript tracking systems in, in, in getting ready for that, but that should be coming in the, in the not too distant future. Um, and then also the, cross, uh, the funder registry, the open funder registry that we provide. Uh, the latest update, which uh, went live last week, has, uh, now includes 25,000 um, funders, which is a fantastic milestone to, to meet. And uh, we're currently, we, we update that every four to six weeks. And uh, we're currently looking at moving that to a continuous update model, uh, as opposed to doing it as a, as a batch update. Uh, in terms of collaborating with others, I know, know that um, everybody that's spoken so far has, has touched upon this. Um, you know, Crossref works very closely with other infrastructure providers, uh, including ORCID. And uh, we have two integrations with, with ORCID. The first is called ORCID Auto Update. And um, this means that when, we, when you as a member um, register metadata, which includes an ORCID um, ID for a, for a contributor, um, when, we get, when we see that in the metadata, we, all, we automatically try to update that ORCID profile um, with the metadata uh, for the work. So we, we send uh, initially, we send an invitation uh, to the uh, ORCID profile inbox asking if we can have permission to auto-update uh, your record for you. Um, we have, uh, it has been relatively successful. Um, I think all time up until um, this month, it was about 47% of those we contacted that agreed. Um, Taking the last few months alone, though, it's really increased to about 60%. Um, and we've made some changes to the wording in the emails that we um, send to those users, which better describe what the service is and the advantages to the researchers, um, and also explains in a lot more detail who we are <laughs> and why you should grant us permission to, um, to update your, your profile for you. The other area of collaboration is through Crossref Metadata Search, um, where you can search for your works and automatically add them to your um, ORCID profile. Um, so your ORCID, your ORCID ID may not be in the metadata um, because it's historic work, but you're, you can find it and uh, push that to your profile. Uh, we're just upgrading to version three of ORCID's API. Um, because they have uh, relatively recently supported more work types than they've supported in the past, such as preprints. So right now, if you were to push a preprint um, from Crossref Metadata Search to ORCID, it would show with a work type of other, and uh, in the not too distant future, it will then be sent with the correct work type of preprint. So that's, um, that's coming up. Oh, 
I think I might have jumped past some slides. Hold on. Here we go. Um, so uh, something I think which will be um, really useful, um, and I know that Ed has mentioned this already, um, we've made some fee changes um, this year to encourage greater participation. Um, Ed mentioned the cross mark fees, which have been removed. Um, and that means we've, um, since we removed the fee for registering cross mark metadata, uh, the number of works with some cross rock some cross mark metadata associated with them has increased to around 13 million. Um, so that's uh, an increase of 1.5 million since March, up 12%, which is fantastic to see. And the number of members taking part in that has doubled um, in that time. Um, that basically means that that um, work has a um, has the metadata for a policy page. It has a URL for a policy page at the publisher's site, which explains your policy on um, uh, changes to those uh, to work items. It doesn't necessarily mean that anything has happened to that work. It simply means that the cross mark button will work and it will say that the current work you're looking at is, uh, is current. <laughs> um, 150,000 works of those 13 million have got some kind of update associated with them. And um, that has grown by 12% since March as well. Uh, I think around 70 or 80,000 of those are, are marked as correction, um, uh, followed by things like uh, with, with retraction and withdrawal. Um, the other thing which we're doing now, actually, uh, probably today, um, is removing fees for um, two uh, key relations that Patricia uh, mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, the first of those is a ver is version of, uh, and the other is translation of. And an example, I, I saw that um, uh, some people were, were commenting in the chat earlier on about um, the, uh, the ability to, I think it was John from American Political Science Association, um, versions of preprints. And I think this is really, really important. Um, a preprint might go through many, many versions um, as the work gets improved. Um, each of those versions should have a separate DOI associated with it so that it could be cited correctly. Um, so from now, um, if a preprint um, server owner um, registers um, versions of that preprint, then they won't be charged for those registration fees of the additional versions of that preprint. Um, and similarly with uh, translation, I think that you know that's becoming increasingly important as we look to support a, a multilingual future, um, provided that the translated work is registered by the same member as the original work, it will no longer incur a separate registration fee. Uh, the other thing that we are, and Martin might pick up on this, um, or maybe not, um, but we're extending the peer review content type um, to be able to be a peer review of um, other, other works. So right now, a peer review has to be associated with a journal article DOI. Um, uh, very soon, um, we will uh, support peer reviews being related to other content types, including preprints. Um, there is provision in the peer review schema uh, for community comment, and that's what we will expect to be being used there uh, for, for preprints. Um, I'm running out of time, so what I'll do is, in terms of also collaborating with other organisations, um, we, we have been working for a while on, on event data uh, alongside uh, colleagues at Datasight. Um, Martin Ripman's on the call, and Martin's the product manager for event data, so I'll probably just hand over to Martin now. Yeah, hello. Thanks, thanks, Brian, and hello to everyone. It's uh, it's really nice to be able to to join you today. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about um, event data, uh, and I mean you're all familiar with with one of the aims of, of Crossref, which is is to link things together, to link uh, scholarly work together. And if someone submits metadata for an article, it has a bibliography and it cites another article, um, then we can join those two things together and we create a citation. And we've been you know, collecting citations for a very long time. Um, but uh, as 
as you know, things happen in different places around the web these days. Um, so articles are, are mentioned either by their DOI or, or with a link to the publisher landing page. Um, and they're mentioned in objects and in places that don't have a Crossref DOI. So this may be you know, news articles, tweets, uh, data sets, and, and so on. And um, we think these are, are interesting for, um, well, obviously for authors, for, for publishers, for a large number of, of organizations. And so we, uh, we've been collecting these together as events um, and making the event, the database of events freely available uh, to query via an API. <clears throat> um, and this is the basic anatomy of an event. So it, it has it has three parts. On the right hand side here, we've got the object, which is something with a Crossref DOI. On the left hand side here, we've got the subject. So this is uh, a link to, um, uh, to, to something uh, around, around the web. Um, and these are the kind of sources that we're picking up. So data citations are really important to us. Uh, we work very closely with uh, with Datacite um, and through Scholix to do that, uh, patents, Wikipedia, tweets, and so on and so forth. Um, and also in the metadata of an event is a very brief description of the relation between these two objects, so uh, the subject and object. So whether it's a citation, annotation, review, discussion, so on and so forth. Um, a part that's really important to us because this is a fully automated process, um, we collect um, evidence logs. So we log uh, you know, where and how we found the subject um, and the decision making process that we went through to decide, OK, this should be an event and this should come into uh, the event data database. Um, since 2017, we've collected nearly 540 million events um, and we've got 13 agents, which are basically uh, bits of software scouring different parts of the web, collecting different um, kinds of data. Um, so yeah, why do we bother doing this uh, and what can you do with this? Um, so you can build queries, for example, to, um, uh, to, to look at what's happening, what events are being triggered by a, a single article. Um, and you might want to scale that up. So you might want to you know, automatically ref refresh that on a regular basis, or it might be that you're interested in only one particular um, source of events and you want to build a service around that. Um, that's great, go ahead and do that. Um, because the use cases are so diverse, you know, we just provide the raw data. It's up to you to interpret that. Uh, we're not into kind of analysis or metrics or these kind of things. Um, but we, you know, we provide the data via the API um, as a service. Um, please get in touch if you have uh, ideas or questions. Uh, my email address is, is there. And there's just a few examples on the right here of, um, of where event data has been put into practice. So as I said, we work very, um, closely with data site on, uh, around data citations. Uh, bibliometric researchers are very interested in this kind of data. Um, uh, impact of research outputs is, is, a, is an obvious use case uh, that publishers are, are very interested in. Uh, and there are other organizations that gather information about, um, uh, about scholarly, uh, uh, scholarly publishing and that also use the data. Um, so we, we will uh, continue collecting the, the data, making it av freely available via the API. Uh, we provide support and, and documentation, and we're very um, keen to um, get in touch uh, with, um, uh, with organizations uh, who, who would like to use event data. Um, and we really want to build a, com a community um, around event data to make sure that it's uh, con continuously being used. Um, there are a few things that we, we would like to do, and I've, I've carried out a product review uh, on event data. Um, and one of the things that came up in that is that the server infrastructure hasn't really been updated since, since we launched. Um, so we, uh, we, we're going to uh, improve that um, and, and really be able to scale up uh, event data. Um, and we're also looking into uh, what kind of new data sources we could add in um, and we're very committed to data citation, as I mentioned, and the relationship data that Patricia mentioned earlier, um, we would like to put that into event data. And, and we, we're just starting to work with the community and, and we'll do this more and um, to see what other kind of sources uh, people would like to, uh, to have uh, in, uh, in event data 
Um, and also, you know, if, if there's someone who has a source of events and they would like to send that to us as well, we are more than happy to hear from them and work with them to do that. Um, and with that, I think I can hand back over to Brian uh, or Rachel to continue. Hey Martin, can you just put the next slide up and then I can uh, quickly finish off. Um, so yeah, so the, I guess this is just the wrap up slide from um, from the product team, um, we we are working hard to finalize the migration of the REST API uh, to the new Elasticsearch version, um, followed by exposing grant information. That's one of the things that people have wanted to see. Um, schema updates uh, as well uh, to support RAW and credit. Um, to, and thank you to those that have um, commented about similar ice check uh, uh, testing for us that's fantastic we'll, we'll contact you outside of the the meeting um the only other thing which is on here which we haven't talked about is um, the introduction of user credentials um that is um uh, providing greater support for individuals to be able to log into crossref systems and perform tasks on behalf of their organization um so that's something that we're that we're working hard on right now, which will improve auditability and things like that. And um, so we'll have more on that uh, in, the, in the coming month. And I guess that's over to Rachel to finish us off. Yes, I, I think it is. So I'm going to, um, I'm going to bring up my slides and it's that I can see as well that there's sort of questions um, coming in. So we're we're picking those up either via ch the chat, but I'm hoping that we'll have some time to answer them with the um, with the group as well. But so just to say, see, thanks to um, to Brian and to Martin for for covering that work in in so much depth. I think it really just speaks to the breadth of what the um, of what the different communities working with Crossref one and I think the many kind of ways that we that we need to resource to resource their needs as well. Um, so I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about initiatives, communities and projects. Um, Ginny and Ed and equally um, Brian as well have talked about the who, the who and the opportunities to, to collaborate on an organisational level, which I think are, are pretty exciting. Um, but I also wanted to look at some areas of kind of areas of focus, as it can feel like there are so many, so many disparate things. And I wanted to try to, to pull a few of those um, together. Um, from what we've talked about today, um, in my head, they sort of roughly um, group into things like affiliations and contributions. So it said being able to collect um, raw IDs, adding credit information to the schema is going to help us support the collection and dissemination of information on who worked on the research and how, and to help institutions report on the outputs of their researchers, because we know that that's such a manual process at present. And obviously this intersects very well with the ORCID auto update and the work that we do with ORCID. I think the, the identifier ecosystem um, concerns projects like Freya, which is a European funded project. And we've participated in that over the last three years. Um, that involves other organisations, again, like Datasite, the British Library, Science and Technology Facilities Council, CERN, and also um, ARDC in Australia um, and DONS in, in the Netherlands. So, so a, broad, a broad group looking at how, um, how to extend the infrastructure for per persistent identifiers as a core component of open research, yes, in the EU, but also globally. And that's looking where our identifiers can intersect, how they can interoperate, and I think how they can support, um, they can support research. Data sharing and citation has come up um, in it on a number of occasions. Um, and that includes the work that, um, it includes the work that, um, that we that Martin's explained very clearly that we're doing an event data and we also co-chair the um the Scolix um RDA group I think there was a question again in the um a question about how we um how we work with um 
how we work with event data. So we do have a Scholix endpoint for event data. So the um, the the content that comes from data sites, so citations from from data site DOIs to crossref DOIs, and going the other way is already available via a Scholix endpoint for event data. Um, but the work that Martin was talking about in terms of um, in terms of um, making the the service more reliable and pulling in um, relationship metadata is, is only going to strengthen the, um, the richness of data that we're able to make available for anyone who's interested in using this information in the Scholix format. Um, we're also participating in Make Data Count to support them in their work to help with the implementation of um, data citation practices, help publishers with that by working obviously in conjunction with our publisher members and societies to, um, to help support other work around data, data usage and citation behaviors, just because these differ so much from, um, you know, from, from behavior around journal articles and also sort of based on the, the principles of, of, of open data um, in this area. And then finally, metadata and standards. Is that I, I genuinely will always bow to Patricia on this subject. Um, but she's been working um, with the JATS for R group, um, with Force 11 on data and software citation, and also on our schema. And as I said, we'd always, we've already mentioned that related to this are initiatives around metadata, like Metadata 2020. And I'd probably class the, the initiative for open access, or sorry, open abstracts in that as well. As I said, and combining those, you know, those um, those kind of key areas with, as Jenny mentioned, the the international um, the, the international nature of our membership, just sort of points to a kind of, um, I guess, those tensions that Ed was talking to in terms of how we're able to resource and support lots of lots of different members, but equally, I guess, the opportunities that we have to to be able to to listen and get input from lots of different member types and different organizations in different parts of the world and the things that they're, that they're trying to do. Because sometimes there, there are a lot of similarities, but sometimes there can be differences that, that then we can, we can try to take account of. Um, another thing that, that we think about a lot is, is adoption. Because that's you know over and above building something into you know into schema or or signing up to to an initiative. So I know that um, that's that's why we're involved in um, in the different groups and how we've looked at sort of soliciting community comments, getting people to try out similarity check, and working with different groups to get feedback and ideas and presenting for different and also presenting for different groups like we're doing today. So finding out what people understand and what they don't and who who we should be talking to and who should be talking to each other um find that it involves getting the right messages to the right people and sometimes it's, it's easy to get into the weeds but reminding ourselves that we need to articulate the high level benefits of um of why of why a particular metadata field or a service is is a value to um, to the community, and that can be difficult because sometimes infrastructure can you know it, it it can work behind the scenes, so it can be harder to articulate those benefits. Said so it involves how the metadata also goes out, so is made available via our APIs, and how services who use the meta want access to it in, in and in what volume. And I said a big part of that equals workflows. Um, we're conscious that for something like registration of grants, it's not just that funders need to register them, but they then need to populate through publishing workflows, be collected via submission systems, and then passed on via APIs. Um, one of the um, the, the screenshots that you'll see on this slide was me sort of trying to pull together a diagram to look at the workflows involved in collecting data citations. And that also pulls in the work of community groups to identify gaps, stakeholders, and to prompt advocacy around services and initiatives. And also the capacity to be able to support services after launch um, and continued support and development and, and evolution. Again, you know, 
the nice thing about the the schema for example is that it can evolve can evolve over time so um so that certainly helps us be reactive to um to different demands um Ginny had mentioned that we've been supplementing our live in-person events with, ses uh, with sessions like these. And Vanessa and Susan um, do great work to, in, supported by our ambassadors, to provide educational webinars for our members in Russia, Ukraine, Indonesia, Brazil, um, South America, and in other Spanish-speaking countries. And we've also point, started to point people to a community forum to start to support open discussions in different languages, which again, our ambassadors and other community members are helping with. So helping people get support in, a, again, an open way rather than lots of one-to-one -one queries. And I said, that's why we asked you to, if, um, to take the time to come along today. So making sure that, that people know what we're, what we're working on and, um, and also get an idea of, of your questions and what you're interested in as well. So the one other thing that we were just going to try at this stage before we um, before we jump into sort of a QA and a and uh, and a wrap up is that um, we're going to give um, going to give a poll a go. We've given you a lot to think about today. Um, so if Zoom polls work for you, I just want to ask if any of these the things that we've talked about are a priority for your um, for your organization. So let me try to launch this now. Um, and you should get a pop-up screen in Zoom um, and be able to um, and to be able to select an option. Yeah, maybe panelists aren't allowed to aren't allowed to vote. Ginny, if you have a strong preference, you can put it in the chat. And equally, as said, if there, if you know, if 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 the things that are priority for you aren't appearing here, then as said just just type them in. Lots to choose from. Okay, last couple of seconds. Okay, and then that should be that should be sharing the results. So, general improvements to um, general improvements to metadata um, have come out on top. Patricia um, will be happy that the the addicts of the addicts of metadata are going to be cleaned out. Um, it said, and then good support um, for um, for work around funding, um, linking funding to publish outputs data citation and, um, and ROAR. So I'm gonna just give, um, just give a couple of minutes before we wrap up to um, to any um, to any Q and A. If there's anything it said, I know that my colleagues have been doing a great job of answering things in the chat as they've as they've come up. Um, Martin, you've got to the the Scolix question. So I said, if you you can use the the Q and A window or the chat, if there's anything that comes up in the next couple of minutes, let us know. Um, and If not, Ed, I'm going to also hand screen sharing back to you just to cover um, again, you know, talking about sort of um, in terms of community involvement, our upcoming um, upcoming board elections, etc. Great. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, yep, I will just uh, get my screen sharing going.
Okay. Yep, looks yeah. fine. Thanks, uh, thanks very much. And uh, thanks for all the, uh, uh, the questions and thank, thanks for all the, uh, uh, the presentations. I think if there are more questions, please definitely uh, uh, ask them. And uh, yeah, so I, you know, just wanted to wrap up uh, by uh, hi highlighting some of the uh, themes, themes that came up. So, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of change and um, uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of engagement uh, within the community. And uh, if it's a feeling that this year things have really accelerated, uh, you know, and I think there, there are some positive aspects to that, but, but there are also some uh, can be negative aspects to that, but, but we're certainly finding by uh, communicating and, uh, and, and, and working together, uh, we're able to, uh, uh, to move forward and, uh, and, and, and get a lot done. And, uh, but we always have to uh, balance that out with uh, making sure that we uh, take time uh, out of work and, and uh, take time to focus on work-life balance and, uh, and, and, and personal issues as well. Uh, so um, uh, I just wanted to mention that a really important part of, uh, of, of Crossref and the Crossref community uh, is uh, our uh, 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 election process which covers how, how how we're governed so to uh, uh we just uh, put a blog post about this but just to highlight uh that that it's election season uh in in more ways than one it's not not it is this election season uh but uh that's not the election that uh, i'm uh talking about but uh it's the crossref election season <laughs> so um we uh, have uh, the slate of candidates for for the election. So each Crossref member uh, has a has a voting contact. Uh, they'll be uh, contacted uh, and emailed uh, uh, tomorrow, I believe, uh, with the, the the link for uh, voting online uh, in the election. The election will run up through our uh, virtual live twenty annual meeting, which is going to be November tenth. And again, there'll be more information about that uh, in the next uh, next couple of days. But we've got a great uh, slate of candidates for the election. And uh, uh, the way the election works now is that there are, uh, there are uh, uh, roughly, the board is, rough, is split in between um, uh, uh, mid-size and small organizations and, and, uh, and large organizations defined on the uh, membership tier to make sure that we have a balance of uh, representation from across the membership on, on the board. Uh, and so you can see here that uh, we've got uh, five candidates uh, for the four seats, for the four small seats that are up for election, small or mid-sized, uh, and then uh, three candidates for the two large seats. Now in different years, there are different number of seats available. It's a 16 member board. So we roughly try to keep it in balance at eight and eight of these, uh, the, 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 the two different categories, but the nominating committee uh, had over 70 uh, expressions, of, expressions of interest and, and did a really thorough process looking at a number of different factors to ensure um, uh, uh, diversity uh, in terms of uh, geography type of organizations um, and, um, and uh, other, other, other issues as, as well. Uh, comparing the seats that were up for election, of course, with uh, bringing in the uh, 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 new people on the board, and so uh, there's some some existing uh, board members who, who are restanding, uh, and uh, uh, but but that uh, process will be getting underway on 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 Thursday. Uh, so we are looking forward uh, uh, to seeing that, and um, and also uh, really looking forward to uh, doing our annual meeting virtually for the first time. We've always done a meeting in November. Uh, face to face, but we're hoping that this is an opportunity to uh, uh, to engage more widely. We usually get about 120 people or so uh, co coming to that meeting face to face, but I, th I think we'll we'll be able to do uh, well uh, uh, by by having more pe people come to that meeting. Uh, please feel free to reach out uh, to uh, to 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 any of us. Uh, and also there are a number of different ways that you can, uh, that you can keep in touch. Uh, <clears throat> we've got a, a blog where we re regularly post uh, many different uh, Crossref staff 
uh, post there. Uh, we also have a developing community forum. So, so please uh, check, check that out. And we're hoping that that can become a forum where uh, members also interact uh, with, uh, with, with each other. Uh, so we're going to be take, take, taking, a look at, uh, taking a look at that as well. Um, and uh, uh, support at crossref.org is always, always great. We've had a really great series of uh, webinars and AMAs, Ask Me Anything sessions. Uh, those have been going uh, really, really well. Um, and, and as I said, uh, uh, you've heard about some of the working in advisory groups. So there's information on those on the website. So please get in touch about those. And, and also, yeah, our, our annual meeting coming up on uh, uh, the 10th of November. And uh, yeah, more information will be about, uh, available about that, uh, about that soon. So I will think I think I will just wrap up by uh, saying that we're always happy to, for people to get in touch. Uh, uh, thanks for thanks for coming today. Happy to stay around if anybody has any 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 further further questions. Uh, but uh, but barring any further questions, I'll I'll just say uh, look look out for Roar. Start planning now to add Roar IDs to your uh, to your metadata. Uh, uh, participate in Crossmark corrections and retractions and, and, and getting that metadata in is, is, is really important. And then we look forward to your continuing support uh, as we improve our, our, our various services and, and, and really try to uh, uh, try to keep improving uh, what, uh, what we're doing. So thank you very much everyone for, for attending and uh, hopefully we will see you again soon. And thank you very much, Rachel, for uh, uh, for moderating and taking us through today. So yeah, we're. I will. I'm going to close the webinar in a minute or two. Um, obviously, thanks to everyone for attending and. I'll follow up with um, with slides, et cetera, by, uh, by email in case there's anything that you want to look back on. Um, but now that you know who we are, if you didn't already, um, feel free to get in touch. Thank you.